inicio a la presente audiencia para nosotros en, esta, en este salón, la número 3, una audiencia dirigida a evaluar eh, la independencia del sistema judicial en Trinidad y Tobago, el tema del debido proceso, agradeciendo mucho la presencia de nuestra muy querida Rosemary, eh, lo dije bien, <ríe> eh, y ex-president ex of the commission. <ríe> eh, muchísimas gracias por, por estar. Eh, tenemos que hacer el señalamiento de que lamentamos la ausencia del Estado Toda vez que a través de este mecanismo de las audiencias, eh, la Comisión tiene una oportunidad de escuchar también la posición del Estado, escuchar sus planteamientos y la ausencia del Estado pues no nos no los permite. Queremos eh, además agradecer a las personas presentes en la sala por acompañarnos en el desarrollo de esta audiencia. Nos gustaría poder entonces inmediatamente dar inicio a la misma, no sé si hice eh, la campana, eh, y eh, agradecer también a mis colegas que nos acompañan en la mañana de hoy, la comisionada Antonia Urrejola, como segunda vicepresidenta de la comisión y relatora para... Eh, Trinidad y Tobago, eh, la comisionada Margaret May McCollett y el comisionado Francisco Eiguren. Eh, no nos acompaña el, ningún relator especial. Bueno, vamos a dar inicio inmediatamente. Eh, ustedes me disculpan, pero yo no puedo hablar en inglés porque mi inglés es realmente malo. <ríe> y, y, pero yo les escucho con muchísimo gusto. Le, ¿sí? ah, ya no sé, es más, para dar, a ver aquí. Le doy la palabra inmediatamente, puede empezar. Good morning, President, Commissioners. The Human Rights Clinic, Faculty of Law, University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, Thanks you for this important hearing. I am Rosemary Bell Antoine, and with me are Janelle Caraspi and Shira Watley. I acknowledge also the work of Alia Espinosa Lewis and the entire clinic. There is no greater freedom than freedom itself, and where the state is entrusted with managing the criminal justice system, detaining persons and depriving them of their liberty purely to secure their attendance at trial for offenses for which they have been accused, but still innocent of, it must do so with every safeguard of this foundational freedom protected in every known human right instrument and a core tenet of the rule of law. Such remand detention must be kept to the minimum necessary to safeguard the public's interest. And we know that the Commission has done very important work on this and offered guidance in its press releases and reports and so on. Both the Commission and Court have pointed out that pre-trial detention is limited by the principles of, quote, legality, presumption of innocence, necessity, and proportionality. It is precautionary and not a punitive measure and should only be imposed in exceptional cases. Yet, in Trinidad and Tobago, these internationally accepted norms are typically ignored in the remand system despite the fact that they are also entrenched in the Constitution. Moreover, these violations have not been addressed or addressed adequately by the courts to date. In fact, there is a long-standing and pervasive problem whereby large numbers of persons arrested for criminal offenses are forced to endure excessive, unjustifiable periods of incarceration on remand while they await trial often in excess of 10 years and more. 
Given that such persons have not been proven guilty and remain innocent in the eyes of the law, such incarceration, often in documented inhumane conditions identical to convicted prisoners, constitutes core human rights violations, including due process, <clears throat> the right to a fair trial, liberty and dignity, as well as concerns about inhumane punishment enshrined in the American Declaration on Human Rights. It also jeopardizes the safety of prison officers. The problem of excessive detention and remand <coughs> sorry, has assumed exorbitant proportions. In some cases, the period of remand reaches the length of the longest sentence that could be imposed for the crimes charged or even exceeds it if found guilty. Alarmingly, Trinidad and Tobago has the second highest remand population in the region, second only to Haiti, with some 60% of prisoners on remand, so that the majority of persons suffering in our jails have not even been found guilty of any crime. Of the more than 2,271 prisoners on remand, 34% or one third have been incarcerated for more than five years, while 12.5% have been on remand awaiting trial for more than 10 years, even incredibly 21 years. In June 2019, we saw the latest example of such travesties when three men who had been on remand for 10 years were found innocent and acquitted of murder. When our clinic visited the prison remand population to further interrogate this issue, we observed a distinct and disturbing pattern. This is a link between female remandees incarcerated for murder and gender-based violence, revealing a sub-layer to the already urgent general remand problem. Such women had been victims of domestic violence and were now accused of killing their partners. We therefore contend that within the remand travesty, there are also serious infringements of the right to equal treatment in terms of its gender dimensions. It is one like so many other gender issues that has been invisibilized. Statistics reveal an alarming 58.5%. Nearly two thirds of women remandees on charges of murder are victims of domestic violence, at least those we know of. Some of these women have been on remand for over 12 years awaiting trial. Such phenomena are only now receiving worldwide attention. A 2018 Cornell study reveals gender biases in the criminal justice system and illustrates that, quote, most women have been sentenced to death for murder, often in relation to the killing of family members in the context of gender-based violence, unquote. It links this to systemic discrimination against women in society. The current paradigm exposes significant gender dimensions accentuating the vulnerabilities of women on remand in Trinidad and Tobago, underscoring structural patterns of gender discrimination. This is in the context of the well-documented high prevalence of gender violence. Domestic violence is a long-standing and serious issue in Trinidad and Tobago, which, despite interventions, still occurs at an alarming frequency. Indeed, statistics show that in 2018 there were 1,244 reports of domestic violence and several deaths. This scenario exacerbates their already vulnerable situations as victims of gender violence, placed further at risk by a system that has failed to proactively address their situation. Inevitably, too, gender variables intersect with socioeconomic vulnerabilities, accentuating the problem. The National Women's Health Survey noted the, quote, major stumbling blocks for survivors of gender-based violence as the inefficacy of law enforcement, a judicial system plagued with inordinate delays, the high costs associated with attorney fees, and inconsistent bail matters. Similarly, we highlight the significant underlying socioeconomic, socioeconomic dimensions of remand injustice in Trinidad and Tobago, another element to the question of equality and equal treatment before the law. 
These rights infringements continue despite long-standing complaints about the system and even formal investigations by state-appointed committees, including a joint select parliamentary committee focusing mainly on remand conditions, which confirmed the need for reform. Recommendations of these committees and other stakeholders have not been implemented and the situation has worsened. We accept that the reasons for these long periods of remand are multifaceted, multi-sectoral, and complex, involving the police investigation system, the judiciary, prosecutors, private attorneys, bail and legal aid systems, and more. While some of these actors are not directly controlled by the state, we contend that the accountability for appropriate legislative and administrative reform resides in the state. Further, international obligations are either not understood or ignored, resulting in harsh and inhumane justice systems. There is little acknowledgement or awareness by the several stakeholders that prison and remand systems must be enveloped within a human rights framework, as must the entire administration of justice, which has the ability to deprive persons of the fundamental rights to liberty. The public, like the state, are largely apathetic, given the assumptions made that anyone on remand must be a criminal, and the fear and draconian impulses invoked because of the current high levels of crime and citizen insecurity. This impulse to stereotype and warehouse large numbers of persons, typically fitting a particular socioeconomic profile to attempt to curtail crime, as illustrated in the now discredited war on drugs is also a pattern in the region, which as the commission has documented, results in ineffective solutions to solve crime. Consequently, there is a wall of silence and lack of real attention paid to this dire situation. These are forgotten and invisible people. Yet, the processes promulgating remand justice in remand injustice are those which the state has the ability to regulate and influence to avoid these current human rights abuses. The remand travesty is a collective and institutional failure which offends the basic norms of the justice system and will require a piercing commitment from many stakeholders to resolve. We therefore wish to build awareness of the serious infringements of human rights at stake and advocate for urgent reform to law and policy. In Trinidad and Tobago, excessive pretrial detentions are not, as required in international human rights law, necessary or proportionate in order to secure the appearance of the person at proceedings or to facilitate the shortest time possible. This thus offends a framing principle of all international instruments on human rights, as embodied, for example, in Article 1 of the American Declaration that every human being has the right to life and liberty. The excesses of the remand system also violate the right to a fair trial with a brief procedure as enshrined under Article 18. The inter-American system has been clear that fundamental rights are violated when undue delay in bringing cases to trial occurs, particularly in situations when accused are in pre-detention. These rights are designed to avoid keeping people too long in a state of uncertainty about their fate, and if held in detention during the, t the period of the trial, to ensure that such deprivation of liberty does not last longer than necessary in the circumstances of the specific case. Thus, it has been consistently held that persons are not released pending trial must be tried as expeditiously as possible. In the Trinidad and Tobago case of Hilaire Constantine, Benjamin, and others, the Inter-American Court pronounced on these issues with regard to a murder accused who alleged due process violations arising from alleged delays, deficiencies in their treatment and condition of detention, and denial of access to legal aid. The court found violations of the right to be promptly brought before a judge, a trial within a reasonable time, and a fair trial. 
municipal courts have tended to accept without question the state's defenses of scarce financial resources in these challenges. For example, in Sukamani and the DPP, the High Court said, the problem of institutional delays is a complex one to which there, be, there may be no simple ready-made solution and the scarcity of financial resources is clearly a factor to be taken into account. The court is entitled to take into account the prevailing system of legal administration and the prevailing economic, social, and cultural conditions that are found in that particular country. Yet, the international human rights law today imposes stricter standards. While we accept that scarcity in resources is a legitimate factor, it is neither the only reason for delay nor is it insurmountable. Just as important are the structural deficiencies and attitudes in the system, which mitigate against better justice. Due process of law as protected under Article 26 is viewed as an umbrella right, even in our courts. It safeguards other fundamental rights and freedoms, and its assertion that every accused person is presumed to be innocent until proved guilty is key to the securing of a fair trial and the protection of liberty. International law has required that deprivation of liberty must be an exceptional measure supporting the presumption of innocent principle that go which governs the judicial process and is a right owed to anyone charged with a crime. Where the accused is detained during the pretrial process and the case takes extremely long to go to trial, the presumption of innocence is jeopardized. Indeed, excessive periods of pretrial detention assumes instead that accused persons are guilty, not innocent, and thereby contravenes international standards. As the Inter-American Court stated in Ricardo Canis and Paraguay, the right to the presumption of innocent, innocence is essential to the effective realization of the right to a defense and accompanies the accused throughout the trial proceedings until a judgment determining his guilt is secured. 13 years remand has been sufficient to find human rights violations of Articles 7 and 8 of the Convention. The infringement against the presumption of innocent Innocence is exacerbated for women remandees linked to domestic violence since until the matter reaches trial, they are unable to raise lesser charges to which they may be entitled, such as self-defense against abusive partners, slow burn provocation, cumulative provocation, diminished manslaughter, or temporary insanity due to the well-documented impacts of long-term abuse. All are charged and remanded simply for murder. Despite these potential defenses, these women find themselves deprived of their liberty for extensive periods due to the slow pace of justice. Thus, in the structural paradigm of vulnerability that confronts women, women are doubly disadvantaged. First, the state fails to adequately protect abused women and subsequently, the criminal law and judicial system further prejudi prejudices women who kill their abusive partners, treating them like cold-hearted murderers. The delays in gathering evidence is one factor in the problem. However, international law has consistently noted that delay due to evidence gathering is not enough to justify the lengthy passage of time between arrest and trial, as the Human Rights Committee noted. It emphasized that a lack of adequate budgetary appropriateness for the administration of criminal justice does not justify unreasonable delays. Institutional delays such as those caused by lack of resources are also inadequate in justifying lengthy pretrial periods. Several other factors cause excessive pretrial detention. Some are structural, institutional, or evidential in nature. Attorneys themselves blame the slow pace of producing evidence for preliminary inquiries and preparation of trial, particularly with the small pool of criminal defense attorneys who, it is claimed, tend to put off all other competing matters when on a trial requesting a series of adjournments by court, which are usually granted and effectively stall other criminal cases under their management. 
the limited number of courts are also blamed. Further, the DPP has complained that his office lacks financial autonomy, which leads to severe staff shortages and even basic office supplies and facilities needed for expeditiously dealing with cases. Under the broad rubrics of due process and the right to a fair trial, the right to bail is, uh, is also prescribed. When examined with the parameters of remand, further injustices are apparent. Bail is typically not available for murder charges. Where bail is available, it may not be affordable. Bail issues are a constant complaint among remandees. Problems are more than the cost. For example, prisoners at Golden Grove said that they were brought before the court infrequently for bail hearings. Prison officers admitted that there was a period of three months where trans transport vehicles were unavailable. Consequently, no remandi was able to attend ba bail hearings. If remandis cannot access bail, they cannot pay bail. We believe that the bail system should be reassessed and reformed as an alternative to remand in Trinidad and Tobago. These deficiencies also make alternatives to pretrial detention, including electronic monitoring permitted under law, but not implemented, even more important. The issue of access to justice is a major component of due process and the right to a fair trial. In the remand context, free legal aid is a vital tool to fulfilling the requirement of legal representation, given the typical Go ahead. In the remand context, free legal aid is a vital tool to fulfilling the requirement of legal representation, given the typical socioeconomic constraints of the remand population. Legal mm -hmm. aid is an essential element of a fair, humane, and efficient criminal justice system that is based on the rule of law, a precondition to exercising rights to a fair trial, and an important safeguard that ensures fundamental fairness and public trust in the criminal justice process. The UN principles and guidelines on access to legal aid in criminal justice systems also acknowledge that certain groups are more vulnerable when involved with the criminal justice system and deserving of additional protection. It provides specific provisions for women, children, and groups with special needs. It also encompasses the right to effective legal aid as contemplated under Mandela Rule 61.3. In our interview sample, a high percentage of remandees utilize legal aid service. Of that percentage, 95% of the women were charged with capital offenses related to domestic violence, illustrating the financial vulnerability of such women. At present, there are no specific provisions granting special protective treatment for these vulnerable women. The situation is compounded since 95% of the female remandees express dissatisfaction with the quality of the legal aid representation that they received. One remandee in particular indicated that she had only seen a legal aid attorney once in the 11 years she has been on remand. Poor legal representation is an important factor in prolonged delay in court trials. There is consensus that cases are prejudiced by the excessive and undue delay. Prisoners complain that for those on murder and rape charges, their cases are compromised due to the heavy reliance on witness statements, which depend on witness memory and in turn adversely affect evidence and trial testimony. Further, there is a culture of adjournments which not only frustrate witnesses but deters them from cooperating because of possible job loss and loss of financial earnings. Because most cases usually take over five years to go to trial, these factors gravely affect the strength of the defense and undermine the fairness of a trial, especially when the delay is unjustified and not attributed to the actions of the defense. Very recent initiatives by the judiciary to access the backlog of criminal cases in the criminal courts involving expedited trials or pleas, status hearings, maximum sentence indications, and case management directions are laudable. 
However, these measures are symptomatic rather than preventative, focusing on ameliorating the delay after it has already been arisen and after the accused rights have possibly already been infringed. It does not treat with the multi-sectoral aspect of the problem, which only the state can impact in a proactive way. To illustrate, some persons in the system who wanted to plead guilty but were never indicted ended up spending more years on remand than their sentence, such as Vido Valen, who spent six years on remand, pleaded guilty, and received four years for a drug offense. One NGO also cautioned that some prisoners are pleading guilty under the program because of their desperation to escape the state of uncertainty they have been residing in for years, so they are willing to surrender their opportunity to prove their innocence. Remandees, although still innocent in the eyes of the law, are treated in identical fashion to convicted prisoners in harsh prison conditions. For example, remandees are not allowed to be outside of their prison cells for more than just one hour per day. Seven to eight remandees share a cell which made to accommodate only two prisoners and all of the remandees. Thank you. Gracias y dis disculpa. Eh, vamos a darle la palabra al señor Gerald Wilson, del de comisionado de la prisión en Trinidad y Tobago, que está vía eh, internet. If, if we, we look at what is happening now, and we are, we are seeing persons on remand for some average of eight, ten, 14 years, it, it doesn't give the inmate himself or herself any hope and, and frust frustrates them, which also brings a burden on the prison's officer as we look at them. So that we have to look at the judicial process, we have to speed up matters so that persons would not spend that length of time in prison. And sometimes these inmates may wake up and tell you, today the jail biting me because it means that they, they are overwhelmed by the situation at times. And you as the officer have to be sympathetic and show a level of empathy. And um, that particular morning, the officer himself or herself may not be in such a good mood so that it creates, you know, this, this time bomb. And that is why if you, if you notice the remand is always the volatile place. We take them on for one hour and put them back. So 23 hours they're locked in. And then you just come out to eat in the morning for lunch and in the evening. But you don't come out yourself. I've been extremely concerned about the, the fact that when persons are incarcerated for that length of time, families are affected. Because sometimes you just look at the person who is convicted or is charged, but you don't ever look at what happens to the families. So that when a person remains in the remand for that period of time, it affects them psychologically, um, sometimes physically, and you see deterioration in them quite, quite quickly based on the length of time that they are here. We have a unique situation in Trinidad where a uh, remanded inmate could spend up to 14, 15 years. If that is the case, then I think it's important that we have programs for them too. Because you have someone and you are saying that, okay, this person is remanded, so you don't expose them to programs. But after 14 years, what happens? They don't have a skill, they probably, they, they didn't, we didn't deal with the anger management, we didn't do anything about them, so they return to society the same way or probably worse than. If, if we, we look at what is happening now and we are, we are seeing persons on remand for some average of 8, 10, 14 years, it, it doesn't give the inmate himself or herself any hope and, and frust frustrates them, which also brings a burden on the prison's officer. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Creo que es muy eh, eh, alentador, por lo menos, la posesión del, del, del señor que reconoce que hay una 
situación que eh, demanda una atención y una, y una reforma. Voy a darle inmediatamente la palabra a la comisionada Antonia Urrejola como relatora de, de país. Um, thank you, um, Madam President. Um, thank you very much for all the information you have given us, and I'm happy that at least we had a video from the, from the representative of the state. It's a pity that nobody was here because actually he's recognizing what you have said, and it would have been an opportunity to discuss with the state maybe a work of um, a plan of action um, because he he's not only recognizing but he put. A point that you didn't even talk about is re, re, rehabilitation. How do you say? Rehabilitation. Yeah, rehabilitation. I I didn't even think about that. I was all the time you were talking about you know the, the pre detention time, 14 years, 10 years, and he said they don't even have a program because they're not they haven't been sentenced. So I, I mean it's even worse than you know than the people that have been sentenced. And he's saying, you know, there are 14 years there, nobody's attending them. So, you know, they go out even worse with no programs, nothing. So he's even recognizing something that you didn't even talk about. And it's a pity we don't have them here because maybe, you know, it was an opportunity to talk with the state and see if we could have like a plan of action with the help of the commission to see how, how we can we as a commission and you as civil society with the state work on a prob on a, pr a huge problem and and i know it's not easy but actually i mean i think this is a very an, an enormous human rights situation that has to be addressed and he has recognized it unfortunately the state is not physically here but maybe we could even i'm just thinking out loud send a letter to the state first, first uh, yeah send a letter to the state uh, yeah meeting. yes and to have a meeting and maybe we could do a working meeting on our next session mm -hmm. in ecuador and inviting them to see how we can address this problem together it may, it's an idea i'm just you know speaking out loud um because i think you have addressed um to two issues that are, uh, that are related, but two important issues. One is, is the pretrial detention and the uh, ab abuse of it, which is, I mean, you talked about, he talked about 14 years, you talked about 10, 12, oh, more than 10, which is, it's a problem in the whole continent, but really, I mean, it's, I don't know how to, how to, you know, what adjective to use, but it's, it's something that you can't believe. I mean, how can somebody be in pre-detention all that kind of years without being sentenced or finally not, you know, but not gu even guilty? That's one issue. And then you addressed, you know, Absolutely. domestic violence and you talked about, I think you talked about two thirds of women that have been accused of murder are victims of domestic violence. Even though, though the issues are related, I mean, there are two enormous big issues that I think, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, two different issues that are related, but are two different issues, which is um, discrimination against women and domestic violence in Trinidad and Tobago that I think Margaret will talk a lot about that too. So I think, I mean, I think this has been um, a very important um, hearing for, for, for me as a, as a rapporteur, I hate that word because I, I hate French, so. <laughs> but um, first of all, thank you for the information. Really, I'm, I'm quite impacted of all the information you have given us. I, it's, di it's difficult to believe all the, all the, the numbers you have given us. I mean, um, you talked about, you know, that the state sometimes has problems with attorneys and, and there's not enough money to have attorneys, et cetera, et cetera. And you can understand that until, to a point. But when you talk about two thirds of the women accused of murder are victims of domestic violence and have been 10 years in pre-trial detention. Mm -hmm. and, and I suppose that it's, it's, you know, how do you say when it's a, a secret that everybody knows, I mean, Everybody must know that these women are there because they had to defend themselves. Everybody knows what the issue is. And they're still there for more than 10 years. I mean, 
something has to be done. And what I what I want to say is, that let's see how I think the only idea I have at the point is maybe see if in Ecuador we could see if the state is willing to do a working meeting to see how we can address this together um, mm -hmm. and, st and see how we can start working on an issue which I know is a huge problem, but step by step. So um, thank you very much. And I just want to ask one question. What happens with these people once they, they are, once, as a uh, uh, once they've been more than 10 years or more, and finally, the, 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 the sentence is that they are not guilty. Do they have any um, recourse? Huh? They are not immediate window. Yeah, afterwards, afterwards, yeah, afterwards. Yes. Okay. Afterwards, the, 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 they will ask questions and then you can answer me because after you've been 10 years, or, or maybe they're sentenced to three years and they've already been 10 years. Ok, gracias, comisionada. Le voy a dar la palabra al comisionado Francisco, que va a retirarse una, inmediatamente para que haga la pregunta. Muchas gracias, presidenta. Muchas gracias eh, a la delegación presente por la valiosa información que nos dan. Y les pido excusas. Voy a tener que salir un poco antes porque tengo que dirigirme a otra reunión fuera de aquí. Eh, quiero, de todos modos, dejar planteada una muy breve pregunta que nos va a ser muy útil a la comisión tener información sobre ello. Más aún, eh, por el reparto de tareas, no está aquí, sino en, abajo, en otra sesión, nuestro relator especial, nuestro relator para personas privadas de libertad, y seguramente él haría esta pregunta. Eh, como ustedes han señalado, eh, bueno, el caso de Trinidad y Tobago se enmarca en una situación de muchos países del continente donde asistimos a un abuso de la detención preventiva, y por eso es que la comisión hace algún tiempo emitió un informe sobre esta materia. Yo querría preguntarles muy puntualmente, en, sabiendo que la, la, esta prisión preventiva debe ser excepcional porque afecta a la presunción de inocencia y que debe tener esencialmente motivos de tipo procesal referidos a la conducta del imputado en la posible obstaculización o evasión de la justicia, el riesgo de fuga... Eh, eh, su actuación concreta y no de un, una especie de situación previa. Yo quería preguntarle si en el caso de Trinidad y Tobago, la ley prevé algunos casos por tipo de delito donde se impone obligatoriamente que se disponga la detención preventiva y en ese caso, de ser así, si el juez tiene alguna posibilidad en el análisis del caso concreto de no otorgar la prisión preventiva o es que la ley por ciertos delitos le obliga a hacerlo. Muchas gracias. Gracias, comisionado. Comisionado. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Ah, uh, dear, this sounds very bad for the common law system. I, 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 um, I must admit, I, I'm a Caribbean person, a Caribbean lawyer, and, and um, <laughs> both Marie and I go back a very long way in women's rights and so on. I am shocked, absolutely shocked. And one of the reasons, uh, as you know, in the common law system and the remand system, some people are remanded to a specific date to be brought back to court for the judge to check on the position of the, the case and the judge to protect the constitutional rights of that person accused. And if the Crown, the prosecution says they're not ready after a certain amount of time, and normally it is two sessions, the judge must release that person conditionally or unconditionally. So what are the judges doing? What are the judges doing? First of all, what are the even politicians doing taking this sort of thing? Because the cost, the financial cost to the country by having so many people on demand is astronomical which could be used by the DPP's office to enlarge his staff, and that you have more judges and more courts, um, to, to move ahead very quickly in, in re respect for these people's rights. What the heck is happening? 
because and and do the are the judges trained in human rights perhaps do you wish the commission to assist in this kind of training because clearly they need training and, and lawyers, the Bar Association should be brought into the matter as well. If lawyers on legal aid only see their clients once in 11 years, that lawyer should have gone to court to apply for their client to be released since the prosecution wasn't ready to proceed with prosecution. And you have the Caribbean Court of Justice right there on your doorstep. I, 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 I am so stunned that I'm almost speechless about what is going on. And the fact that today in Trinidad, a woman who is a victim of domestic violence, who kills her perpetrator, cannot use that in defense, in her defense, cannot effectively use it. That's another training for the judges, no? So, the co as you know, you, you've been pre uh, president of the commission. We do, do give technical assistance. I think Trinidad is in dire need of that. And the judiciary, the legal system, the Bar Association members, uh, and, and more and more. The, the commissioner of prisons mentioned the fact this is a destruction of families. Families. Mm -hmm. If I am in jail for 11 years and I have my husband and so on, he's going to wait for 11 years and not go and get involved with so many other women and forget about me in jail. And then the children, young children, who may be left behind without succor from their, their, their mothers who are violent, who are treated violently. Or, any, or a male who leaves his wife and children. This is terrible. I mean, I am stunned. Mm -hmm. I am, did we go to Trinidad and Tobago? Yeah. In our visits? Yeah. We went? Well, I wish we'd known this before. Because then we could have put very hard questions to the government members that we spoke to. But I still think that we can, as, as, as the rapporteur for the country has said, Antonia, we can still send uh, an Article 18 letter and, and ask some pretty strong questions. Could you give us copies of your presentations? Because those figures in there are, are, will be vital for our use. Uh, um, I really am not going to ask any, any questions uh, other than whether you want technical, um, you think you could use technical support from us. And um, mm -hmm. do you have many cases of accused who are um, put, placed on remand during the, go um, the governor's um, uh, pl president's uh, pleasure because of their mental state and do they do they figure largely in that because the the one case i know which was a big scandal in jamaica was somebody who was forgotten who had been detained um during the governor general's pleasure because of his mental state and he was fell through the cracks and was there for 21 years and that was an enormous scandal um so do you have that as well and if so, could you figure them into the, the equation? Um, um, because if somebody is not in mentally fit, they ought to be. Thing. And the question of women's uh, um, lack of access to justice uh, um, is it's, it's apparent. And, and the others, all these people, the whole line of them, 60% of all prisoners, my God, their, their lack of access to justice is clear and apparent. So we have to do something seriously. And thank you, thank you for bringing it to our attention. And we, we know that we will do what we can and be in contact. Thank you. Gracias, Margaret. La secretaria adjunta, la doctora Maria Claudia. 
Gracias, English. presidenta. Eh, en esta oportunidad, aprovechando que tenemos traducción, vamos a hablar en español. Este, la, la pregunta que quería realizar, que es más de carácter técnico en seguimiento, los puntos que plantearon las comisionadas tenía que ver justamente con eh, la posibilidad que exista en Trinidad y Tobago de utilizar las medidas alternativas a la prisión preventiva, particularmente en el caso de mujeres, eh, toda vez que teniendo en cuenta el, el, el impacto diferenciado, la afectación diferenciada que tiene la, la privación de la libertad en las mujeres, justamente por el, tupo, el, el punto que hacía la comisionada Macaulay de… Eh, la afectación sobre los niños, sobre eh, la familia, este, sí se podía considerar. Eh, adicionalmente, poner a disposición eh, la, la, la cooperación técnica que se pueda brindar desde el, la, la eh, Secretaría Ejecutiva, la Comisión Interamericana, en el tema de prisión preventiva, a partir del informe publicado eh, sobre el uso excesivo de la prisión preventiva y el, y el seguimiento a ese informe que incluye una guía, técnica no particular para asesorar, orientar tanto a eh, las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, pero particularmente la academia, pero particularmente a los funcionarios de Estado. Y finalmente, plan, preguntar si ustedes han eh, valorado la posibilidad de utilizar algunos de los mecanismos de protección que tiene la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos para casos concretos, como es el sistema de casos individuales, como es el caso el, eh, de medidas cautelares. Y preguntar eh, por eh, eh, la presentación de información específica de casos de mujeres que han estado sometidas a estas condiciones o personas, inclusive hombres, que llevan más de 13, 20 años en prisión preventiva. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Gracias, María Claudia. Yo eh, solo quisiera eh, hacer dos precisiones que creo que es muy importante para, para la Comisión, eh, atendiendo lo que han planteado las comisionadas y la eh, Secretaría Ejecutiva. Eh, se trata de una práctica del de sistema judicial o la normativa permite esa, esas respuestas por parte del sistema judicial. Para hablar de una transformación, para hablar de, de cambios, eh, yo creo que es eh, muy, muy importante eh, hacer esa precisión eh, porque si se trata de práctica, entonces es hacer una, una precisión con los, con los jueces, como dice la comisionada Margaret, de, de, de formación, el, el conocimiento de, de lo que en detención preventiva la, la, la propia ley de, del país establece y si se están cumpliendo o no. Eso por un, por un lado. Y por otro, eh, eh, además de los informes de los que señala la, la Secretaría Adjunta, está eh, eh, con el comisionado eh, relator para privados de libertad, eh, una y, y mujeres creo que también, eh, el, el, una, preparándose un informe en materia de la prisión de eh, las mujeres. O sea, ¿cómo la información que ustedes puedan proporcionarnos en esta temática va a ser muy, muy valiosa porque se está precisamente <coughs> recogiendo lo que en materia de privación de libertad con esta perspectiva de género y la realidad eh, que se está viviendo con el impacto en la vida de los hijos, en la vida eh, familiar. Creo que es eh, muy, muy importante contar con esa información. Y eh, también atendiendo la petición de la Secretaría Adjunta, eh, es importante que tengamos una relación de casos específicos de, eh, de esta privación de, de libertad en detención provisional que exceda, incluso como señalaba eh, 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 Rosemary, eh, se, eh, que cumplen la pena, la pena máxima que pudiera ser impuesta por el, por el delito que están <coughs> siendo eh, procesadas. O se nos gustaría también tener ese dato. <coughs> Disculpen. 
le vamos a dar la palabra para escucharles. Uh, thank you, distinguished commissioners, for your comments, very helpful comments and questions. I will do one or two, and then I'll pass it on to my colleagues, um, in particular those to do with bail and how the law operates and on the family, because one of my colleagues didn't get a chance to give you more information about the family, because we did expect a little more time because the state wasn't here, so, um, but we do have more information. Just to say on the point of technical assistance, we welcome that suggestion. I would say that, as you saw, the, we thought it was very important to bring the words of the Commissioner of Police himself, who's been working, although he's an arm of the state, also very much an advocate. And yes, all of these issues that he raised, he's certainly very interested in moving forward. So I think as judiciary, we did mention that um, there have been some recent initiatives, but we have said it's a multifaceted problem which requires all of the stakeholders and we need the state to lead it. But we do think that there, in there we have important, um, you know, um, the, the, the aspects of the state, judiciary and so on, who can, I think, dialogue in a deeper way with the commission and we welcome that. The suggestion about other ways apart from letters, precautionary measures, is certainly things that we will look into, to, into. Since our visit, women have in fact been talking to us over and over, those in remand, and it is, it's certainly um, an, an important idea to bring, to move the agenda forward. Yes, we underscore again the structural gender discrimination that's taking um, place. There are one or two possibilities in the law, like electronic monitoring that we might have mentioned, but has not been implemented. Um, and also we did not get the opportunity to say to you that we have been observing what our neighboring countries have been doing. Jamaica was one that we pulled out as a good example after it had its own scare. You mentioned some of it. And so we are well aware of the recommendations and some of the things that they did in terms of time limits, uh, limits as well as what the commission in its reports and press releases have I've been advocating and we do support those. So <clears throat> I think in terms of the technical assistance, um, we would certainly uh, bring that forward. I'm now going to ask Janelle Caraspi to talk about the bail issue, the family, and uh, just to say, um, before I say that, we're not aware of any particular case in terms of mental illness, but we did make the point that women who have been constantly abused, there, there's a lot of document about, about, in, about yes, temporary insanity and mental health issues, and in fact, um, my colleague may say a bit more about that too, as to that continues in the remand, not surprisingly. So over to you. <clears throat> Hi. So in Trinidad and Tobago, we have seen where there has been no change to the legislation. We still have no bail for murder, despite the different degrees. If it's self-defense provocation, it's straight across the board, no bail for murder. However, yeah, which is very accurate. Jamaica, we have seen, has made a lot of strides in terms of the lengthy times remandies have stayed on in um, prison, right? Um, they have changed their, their legislation, and bail may be granted for murder by a registered magistrate or judge. So they have time limits placed on trials. Trinidad and Tobago does not have that. So we see a breakdown in the home between the parent, the child, and the mother, who now has to stay in remand to await her trial more than 10 years, sometimes 11 years plus. There's nobody who, there with the family, with the children, which essentially is a loss and a breakdown in family life, which are one of the key aspects, yeah? Um, even further, we see Dominica, Jamaica, St. Lucia, other Caribbean states making changes, yet Trinidad and Tobago still has not. Legislation needs to be changed. We need to have implementation of programs besides that, just programs and a future, something that we can bring the family and mothers can be there, even though they have to wait their trials to finish up. Last and finally, um, we see plans where people even stay longer waiting to get their sentences before the courts for trials, and sometimes they save more than their 
sentence or the prescribed time for the crime. So in the case of Vido Valen, he actually served six years on remand before getting to trial and he was four years was his sentence time. So we, we see the disparity straight across the board. Thank you. One thing. Um, the, um, Antonio, Commissioner Antonio and, and Second Vice President asked about what, 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 um, how do you explain that sort of thing yeah. when somebody has been in remand for so many years mm -hmm. and they tried and their sentence is passed and if the sentence is, say, if they've been there for 12 years, the sentence is 12 years, the judge normally takes that period of 12 years into account and the man walks and goes home. Yes, and but, that will happen as well. Right. That can and That's will happen. That can and yeah. will happen in the courts. Mm -hmm. um, but as we were saying very often, you have already gone past, or, or in some cases at any rate, but that the judge can and will do that in Trinidad. And is as there well. a recourse in Trinidad? In Jamaica, if that happens, that man can sue. We have not seen, well, our position is that there we really have no system of remedial measures, whether it is re, to reintegration. It's just a forgotten issue, a forgotten issue. So we need to have structured programs in place for all of those things as well. Yeah, muy bien. Bueno, creo que ha sido una, una oportunidad eh, muy, muy valiosa para eh, recoger esta información y como dice Margaret, cuando uno escucha esto, uno puede, un, la, la reacción es que cómo puede estar pasando esto, ¿no? Y, y, y el tema de eh, el, la responsabilidad que tiene el Estado de una detención preventiva que exceda eh, incluso el, el promedio de, de la pena eh, es inconcebible. Y si y si sale eh, absuelto, tiene que haber algún tipo de responsabilidad por parte de, del Estado. ¿no? Yo creo que eh, la, la propuesta de nuestro ofrecimiento de cooperación técnica, yo creo que podemos eh, hacer algún esfuerzo para una coordinación en, para Ecuador, a ver si es posible, y mantener una comunicación con respecto a las fórmulas que pudiéramos eh, eh, empezar a, a, a programar para, para un trabajo de, de cooperación. Muchísimas gracias y damos por concluida esta audiencia. <risa>